At the outset, I would like to thank the Academy and Parthuda for giving me this opportunity to present something which is still not done, is still in the conceptual stage. And unlike the previous speakers, I have myself not contributed anything significant to the research on microbiomes. Our first study on leprosy skin microbiome is still going on, it's not in the publication stage. So I'm not going to present any data as such in this particular presentation. What we have conceived of is what we believe is something very ambitious and something which is very challenging and what we believe is very important for the country to undertake is a large scale Indian human microbiome initiative which Parsada also is a part of it, Sharmila is a part of it and we have had a few brainstorming discussions on this within the Department of Biotechnology and involving several partners and what I would like to present is the study design of that. But before that, uh, uh, about uh, five minutes introduction on uh, before going to the Indian Human Microbiome Initiative on what we are actually composed of and it has significant overlap with some of the previous speakers what they have presented. So the human body is composed of essentially if you take at the cellular level, large number of cells and a recent estimate in the journal which is public uh, PLOS Biology it suggests that human body consists of about 10 to 100 trillion cells, right? And the estimate comes from the fact that the typical mass of a human being is about 100 kgs, let us say. And the volume of a cell would be something like this. And therefore, a total mass of all the cells in the body would be of the order of this. And the number of cells would be the weight of the human being by the mass of each of the cells, about 10 to 100 trillion cells, is the estimate. Now, if we compare this with the total number of bacteria that live over our body, uh, some of the previous speakers said that is about 10 to 100 times bacteria live over our body than our human cells themselves. And this study has actually tried to correct that perception and uh, uh, they say that total number of bacteria in the body is not really 10 to 100 times but about the same number of cells or bacteria that uh, are resident on our body. Now the different human cells actually if you try to uh, segregate them in different cell types, most of the large part of the body is essentially erythrocytes about 84 percent of the body is about erythrocytes, about 5 percent platelets and so on and so forth. Right? This is what actually the human body is composed of essentially, different kinds of cell types. Now as I said, about equal number of bacteria according to this study are resident on our body, they are essentially common cells and they help many different aspects of human physiology, these bacteria, they are very helpful to human body and that is essentially why we actually want to study this particular bacteria, bacterial species as also the previous speakers have highlighted these aspects. So the total number of human cells in the body is of the order of about 10 to the power 13, 14 and the same number of bacteria are resident on human body as uh, also uh, some of the previous speakers talked about, right. In terms of the total mass of these cells, the bacterial cells compose of only about 0.2 percent of the total mass, right. So although in number they are almost equal. But in terms of mass, they are only about 0.2 percent of that and simply because of the fact that they are much tinier than the normal human cells. A typical human cell would be of the order of a few microns to tens of microns, while a bacterial cell is of the order of about 1 to 2 microns, right. So bacterial cell is much smaller than a human cell and therefore the total mass that they contribute is so small. But nonetheless, they contribute enormously to the physiology of human being. Right. So, and some of these aspects I will just try to highlight in the next few slides. So, this is the slide that also Sharmila showed earlier. Now, this estimate as I said has been revised is not 10 s to 1. So, uh, it is about 1 s to 1 uh, human cells versus bacterial cells. And uh, human microbiome consists of about 10 to 100 trillion cells. It is equivalent to be considered to be an organ in the human body. It was discovered as Parthuda also mentioned uh, uh, earlier about 2001. And the uh, first of the papers really came out in 2005. So the field is uh, literally about 10 years old, 10 to 11 years old and on the verge of literally explosion at this stage, right. It is still very poorly understood. Uh, we do not understand all aspects of what these bacteria do on our body. We know that bacteria are actually helpful to human body. We also know some of the bacteria are not helpful to human body and any disbiases as also was highlighted in the last three talks in the bacterial composition that resides on the human body can cause several disorders, right. Very uh, large number of disorders are at, have been attributed to the disbiases in this bacterial population on the body. They contribute significantly to human metabolism. I am going to give you one very interesting example of this. How do bacterial cells contribute to metabolism? 
and uh, the composition of bacteria that reside on our body impacts our health and also are positive for many of the diseases. So this is the example that I actually wanted to highlight about the metabolism. It's a very interesting example published about six years ago. It actually talks of enzymes which can degrade seaweed in Japanese population. Now these enzymes are not uh, uh, present in either Western population or non-Japanese populations. And that's clearly uh, due to the dietary habits of Japanese which have a high percentage of seaweed. right? And this uh, has been very clearly shown now that these carbohydrate active enzymes from marine bacteria have been actually horizontally transferred or have been acquired in the gut of the Japanese citizens. Right? So because of their dietary habit, these enzymes are present there and they effectively degrade the seaweed. And the news and views that came in science which accompanies this was very interesting. The title, uh, the title was Americans don't have guts for sushi. Right? So I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, nonetheless, it actually highlights that bacteria actually do very something very interesting on our parts of different parts of the body. Now many of the disorders they have been correlated with the disbiosis of uh, the bacterial population that resides on the body. Uh, for example, Charmila highlighted type 2 diabetes is now clearly established that a disbiosis in the gut bacterial population leads to type 2 diabetes. Obesity is also well known. Some cardiovascular diseases are known which have been correlated with the bacterial population which exists in the uh, stomach and the gut. IBD also is known. Obesity as I said, autoimmune disorders, metabolic syndromes, even cancer and autism have been related to the bacterial population that exists. In fact, uh, some of the interesting thoughts that have come up in the last couple of years is that the way in which we think also depends on the bacterial population that exists in our gut. So if someone disagrees with that, I am going to tell that person that your bacterial population needs to be examined again. Right? Now, uh, this actually leads to some very interesting applications. And the potential applications that can be thought of are, for example, we can actually develop new biomarkers based on the population that exists here. All right. So if there is a disbiosis, we can correct that disbiosis by introducing other bacteria onto that particular population and therefore we can have actually biomarkers or interventional strategies. We can have new therapeutic strategies and already people, uh, some of the strategies are already in the market in terms of pre and probiotics, but that can be refined. And it can also increase our understanding of the etiology of complex diseases and health. Right? So, these are the inter interventional things that we can think of. And lo and behold, there are already companies which have been floated and I have just shown you a company called Second Genome and I believe we do not have any potential conflict of interest in tackling this session on Second Genome. Uh, we have not received any funding, but I mean there is a company called Second Genome which actually looks at microbiome of human body and tries to suggest interventions based on uh, this particular thing. I am going to skip these two in want of time. What I want to actually now come to is to justify why do we need to undertake a study in India on this particular thing. Now we recognize the fact, uh, the medical doctors in this audience would recognize the fact that all the therapies that we actually undertake here for whatever disease have been based on clinical studies that have been carried out in the West. And we are not very sure that any therapy that we take, name any disease and any therapy, whether it is equally effective on Indian population or not. That Indian population is distinctly different than the Western population. And that work also has been shown a few years ago by a large cohort which was actually undertaken and shown that we have distinct what we call as single nucleotide polymorphisms in the Indian population than the Western population. And therefore, we are not very sure whether the therapies that we take are really as effective as in this case. But that also points out to the microbiome that genotypically we are very different than the rest of the world. Our microbiome also is likely to be different than the rest of the world. And in fact, uh, some of the uh, early work uh, done by Sharmila's group and some of the early work done in Yogesh Shauche's group in NCCS has actually shown that Indian microbiome is actually different than the rest of the other world's microbiome. And that actually is a very strong justification that uh, why we should undertake Indian microbiome if we have to come up with certain interventional strategies in future. To do that, we must actually statistically sample the entire population correctly. And for that, uh, we have about 6,000 communities in India, which consists of about 40,000 different endogamous groups. Right? So these are the kind of uh, population that we have in the Indian context. And we need to sample all these communities correctly for this. Now, Parthoda has recently shown in this uh, particular paper that in addition to the 
two dominant uh, clades that we have that is ancestral North Indians and ancestral South Indians. There are other two ancestral mainland Indians which are the AA speaking tribals that is the ancestral Austroasiatic clade and also the ancestral Tibo, uh, Tibeto Burmans clade which exists in India. And the Andamanese trait is actually distinctly different than these. Right? So there are about five different clades that we can think of that we, are consist, that we consist of. The measure of population differentiation, if we actually, there is a statistical measure which shows what, how different are these populations. That particular measure in the Indian endonomous groups is much larger than that of Europeans. So this is a paper published by Lalji Singh and uh, Thangaraj uh, five, six years ago. And they show that Indian populations are very well structured, right? So because of the endogamy that we have, the population is exceptionally well structured. And therefore, all these three lead to a very exciting hypothesis is that if there were a genotype to microbiome correlation, you know, that means that the DNA sequence that Indian population has, right, the genomes that Indian population has, whether that has any correlation to the kind of bacteria that our body harbors, is there a correlation between that? It's a very exciting biological hypothesis. And if you want to test that, ideal population would be to study would be that of India. And this is one of the hypotheses that we can actually test in that. But that's only one part of it, right? So this is one hypothesis. Secondly, the differences in population are generally reflected in the dietary patterns. And even in India, we know that different populations have very distinct dietary patterns, right? I mean, there's no secret or no revelation in that that we have very distinct dietary habits and therefore it's likely that the bacterial populations that we harbor are might be actually influenced by the dietary patterns that what we have. The tribal populations that we have have been seen to be largely unaffected by the quote unquote modern living style and the diet lifestyles and therefore prevalence of lifestyle related disorders like obesity, diabetes and all. They are also known to be significantly lower in the tribal population and they can be studied by comparing that with the standard uh, normal population like us. Right? So if you compare this with the tribal population, maybe perhaps we can get some insights into what are the correlations between the microbiomes of the tribals and uh, the people of different lifestyle like ours uh, here in this particular audience. Now the composition of uh, bacteria in tribals and in the western population are very distinctly different that has been shown by the work that Sharmila presented and also uh, I think Vinith alluded to that, uh, the, the, the abundance of Prevetola in Indian population has been known and it is hypothesized that because of our carbohydrate rich diet that we have, Indian population has abundance of Prevetola which the western population does not seem to have. Right? So this is one of the observations that has been made once again by multiple people in India in recent times. So this offers another justification that why we should study the Indian population in terms of the microbiome uh, study. Now uh, we also know uh, that the microbiomes of different populations are different. Once again there are early results, uh, one result from the Gohati study and one from Dr. Shauche's study in NCCS and we know in the background that microbiome of uh, one of the studies carried out in Japan has shown that Japanese population is significantly distinct from other populations and which cannot be simply explained by the diet alone. So probably there is a genotype, uh, microbiotype uh, correlation in that particular population. And microbiome irrespective of different lifestyles and age can be distinct from races in the communities of the part uh, of the world and so on and so forth. So here the Indian community is represented in red and what you can see is that the microbiome of Indian community is quite distinctly different than the other populations in the world. right? So there is another reason to study that if we have actually thinking of, we are thinking of certain intervention strategies in future, we must understand the microbiome of the Indian uh, population. And when we talk of microbiome, I will refer to my first slide again. We look at the microbiome which is resident at different parts of the body, not gut alone, but a gut, the oral cavity, the skin, and in a small number of cases, also the vaginal microbiome. So they are the kind of things that we need to address is what we need to look at is different parts of the body and uh, uh, microbiome on that particular body. So this is the statistical sampling that we have come up with. Uh, we had a few brainstorming sessions in NCCS and that suggests that we will actually sample about 90 communities with a total subject size of about 20,000. It is fairly massive. Uh, it cannot be done very easily. 
but we are still hopeful that in a reasonable time we will be able to complete this one if we undertake this. And what are shown here in brackets are different endogamous groups that have been uh, sampled from different populations of the country. So, this is the kind of uh, sampling that we would like to undertake uh, based on the uh, data that we have earlier. And a zone wide recruitment of subjects would be something like this, uh, uh, shown here, the number shown here, which uh, approximately is about 20,000 or so. And as I said, five different body parts is what we would like to try to do. There is the gut, the oral cavity, and three different parts of the skin is what we would like to understand. Right? So, and uh, uh, participating institutions which are not limited to currently are the National Center for Cell Science in Pune. We would like to undertake this work on behalf of all the participating institutes. There is the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. We have representatives from AIMS who attended these meetings in the past, CMC Velo. Then from the northeast, we have the Institute of Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, IMPHAL. The Institute of Advances in Science and Technology, Gohati. From uh, uh, east, we have NIBMG Calcutta, which uh, Partha Muzumda represents. We have from Bangalore, the FLRHT from uh, uh, which is uh, headed by Dashan Shankar. And this also is because Dashan Shankar's interest was whether he can find eventually some correlation to Ayurveda and all, but it is not included as one of the objectives in the initial part of the study. And uh, analysis and storage and retrieval data and all would be taking helps of the TCS and the persistence systems in Pune. So, this is essentially what we actually done. I have not gone into the details of the study design, but this is essentially to present here that is something very challenging that we would like to undertake and we would like to see if we can actually do this in the next few years or so. So, thank you very much for your attention.